Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done over 550 of them now. And uh, if you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. The interview you're about to see was done in the context of a webinar offered in May by the Science and Non-Duality Conference <clears throat> entitled Wisdom in Times of Crisis. Um, in addition to this interview, there were dozens of others, um, interviews and presentations with people like Vandana Shiva, Peter Levine, Gabor Mate, Deepak Chopra, Rupert Spira, and many others. Although the webinar is over now, it is archived online. There's a link to the archive in the description beneath this video and on the page for this interview on batgap.com. So, enjoy the talk. Welcome everyone to the Wisdom in Times of Crisis online event. Um, where we explore and reflect on the challenges and opportunities this unique time is offering us. My name is Rick Archer. Um, I am the host of the Buddha at the Gas Pump interview series. Um, my guest in this hour, this session, is Sally Kempton. Um, Sally teaches tantric non-dual wisdom from the heart of the Kajimara Shaiva tradition. She is a master guide to the experience of awakened kundalini and is known for her ability to apply esoteric wisdom to the issues of our lives. Um, in preparation for this interview, I listened to an interview that Sally and I did about six years ago, <clears throat> and uh, it was really, we covered a lot of ground. It was good stuff. So if you enjoy this and would like to hear that, go to batgap.com and go to the past interviews menu, and there's a search page where you can search for, just type in the word Sally and it'll come right up. <clears throat> um, so in that interview that we did six years ago, Sally and I talked a lot about the sort of the subtler realities of creation and how those interrelate and interact with the more obvious level that most people are familiar with. Um, and we talked about a number of other things, but we might touch on that today with reference to the pandemic and what, I don't know, we don't want to get too speculative, but, you know, how an appreciation of the subtler aspects of creation might be relevant to understanding what's going on um, in the world at large. Um, there's also some interesting thoughts we can get into about the fact that, I mean, just about everybody listening to this has been on spiritual retreats. And uh, Sally and I both have led many spiritual retreats as well as been on them. And, you know, when, it, when you're on a spiritual retreat, it's sort of a, a forced seclusion or a forced dive into, a, not forced, it's, it's a voluntary dive into a deeper, more settled state. And often, you know, things come up when you're in that deeper state. And, but you're kind of prepared for it, and you, you, you've you know, perhaps done many of them. You know what's going to happen. You, you're not surprised. And hopefully there are some wise teacher or teachers there to sort of help us through it if we begin to have doubts or fears or whatever. And, of course, this kind of thing is traditional in ancient cultures as well. There, you know, ancient cultures around the world have initiations of various sorts that when you reach a certain age, you know, you you're tested in a way and pushed to your limits. <clears throat> and, uh, but, but there too, there are elders who determine your, your suitability and capability of doing such a thing and wouldn't have you do it if you weren't ready for it. But it almost seems like the world now is kind of being involuntarily put on a, an initiation of a sort or a retreat of a sort. And, you know, a lot of people are really not happy with what's happening in their lives and don't have a lot of explanation for it from any wise elders and certainly not any politicians. So there's a lot of fear and a lot of upset and all kinds of concerns. So maybe these are some of the points we can cover in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. What do you think, Sally? Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. Definitely. So do we want to start with the forced 
retreat? Wherever you'd like to start, whatever you'd like to do. I always find myself answering the last point that was made. So that was fresh in your mind. (laughs) Fresh in my mind. So, you know, I I think it's really true that probably you and certainly me went, oh my God, this is cool. (laughs) You know, I, I have a month, which is what it seemed like at the time, you know, to just be with myself and practice and read. And then I, you know, personally, I started doing uh, teaching a six week teleseminar, which had been scheduled. So my retreat time turned into study time and, you know, preparation time for that. But it was a class on the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. So it was quite uplifting. And um, so in the midst of my, uh, me actually having a really good time, you know, in, a, in this retreat situation, which as a spiritual practitioner, I'm pretty prepared for and look at as a privilege. And then I'm reading and talking to all these people who, as you say, have absolutely no background in this and are freaking out or, you know, terrified or not getting along with their families. But what I noticed, and again, I'm, I'm, this is definitely third hand because it comes from reading or talking to people, is that as the lockdown went on, people got more and more settled and they more and more began to find a way to, to be okay with what they were going through. Plus, you know, though I've heard there are a lot of COVID divorces going on, <laughs> that, but most of the people I know, once they had gotten through the irritation at you know, things about their partner that they hadn't had to live with when they were both going out to work, actually found themselves much more settled in their relationship, much more open. So I think that the power of retreat, of you know, being really being, uh, if, as it were, forced to get quiet and look at your stuff and find a way to be in a settled, centered place, has worked for a lot of people. Mm. Now, you mentioned that, you know, this was rather alien to the people to whom you were teaching this course, but I bet you that, you know, they are in the top 5% of people who would be comfortable, you know, or, or in terms of their comfort level with yeah. a, a, an inward stroke, whereas the vast majority of people in the world may never have done anything like this. Um, so perhaps it's been much more difficult for them than it is for the people in your retreat, or the people who are listening to this talk right now. Yeah, I would say that most of, most, of, most of us, most of the people who are here, probably know exactly what we're talking about and maybe even welcomed it. Yeah, you know, we, we've paid good money to go on <laughs> retreats exactly, where we just sit exactly. in a room or stare at a wall or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think the, you know, the big problem has been for people who who are economically impacted in a in a huge way, and that's certainly true of many people in the yoga world, uh, you know, and in the in the spiritual world. Um, and on the other hand, we have Zoom, so um, there have been a lot of programs like this one that that I think have been profound for people. So offering a lot of guidance. Yeah. Um, what do you have? Do you have any thoughts on the notion that? This may be some kind of mass global initiation of some sort uh, that could have a profoundly maturing effect on the populace at large, just the way individual initiations do. Well, I have certainly heard this, and I, and like you, I've been hearing this for years. Um, so, someone that I co-taught a course with a few years ago uh, is very, very intent on this topic. He believes that because of our, the way we've treated the earth, you know, especially in the modern era, we're, we're at a day of reckoning and we're being, and we're, we're essentially being punished for the way we've treated the earth. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't believe that. So, but I, what I do feel is true, and I think we've talked about it before, is that those of us who've been practicing for a long time, practicing since the 70s, and feeling the, the energy that has you know, intensified on the planet in the last 30, 40, even 50 years, uh, definitely can feel that there's, a, there's an intensification of certain trends that have to explode one way or the other, and that 
for people who are who have done practice, who have an inner focus, who are able to kind of smooth out the currents of craziness in in their minds, uh, this is this can be a powerful initiation. And I would say there are a lot of people who just are not prepared for it. You know, and um, and then that's the open question: is is this going to be the kind of initiation? That, for instance, I experienced. I think possibly you experienced. Uh, you know, at you know, at the moment of awakening, transformation in my twenties, where from you know my ordinary, crazy, downtown hipster, any story that feels exciting is my story. That that person, you know, coming up against the, the exigencies of cr- certain crises in my life was catapulted into a real shift of priorities, which started my spiritual life. I mean, this may be true that more and more people are going to be able to use this pandemic as a spur to their own awakening. I certainly hope so. Yeah, it may be. Um, I know that there's obviously there's a backlash against it. And a lot of people just want to get back to the bars and the restaurants and then, yeah. you know, show their bravado uh, or their disdain for science by not wearing masks. I mean, they're on the news now. Um, we'll see if they can get away with that. Um, you know, but if you think of this as a punishment, I agree, I agree that with you that we wouldn't necessarily see it that way. I mean, if you're, if you're a little kid and you're doing dangerous things, playing with fire or hitting yourself with a hammer or something, and your, your mother or father stops you and pulls you away from it and maybe even scolds you, you might see that as a punishment, but it's not in the, in, in a more mature view of things. Right. Yeah. True. True. And, you know, the laws of causality operate no matter what we think or, you know, how much we disbelieve them. That there, there are certain causes and conditions that, that just happen naturally. So, I mean, there's no question that we've despoiled the earth and perhaps, perhaps some, in some ways innocently, perhaps in some ways, you know, with, with some form of exploitive malice. So obviously, there are consequences to that. And th- go ahead, continue. Yes, go ahead. I, I, so um, at this point, it, it seems less significant to me to think about how this happened. I mean, we know what we've been doing. <laughs> we know how we've been treating the planet and each other. Uh, we know how fragile our systems are. We, you know, some of us have been saying this for years, so it's not a surprise. And, it's, and we knew that there were going to be serious consequences, and we've been seeing them, you know, wildfires and earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and now this. So, the, you know, the question is, as I'm sure, you know, it is for you, is, okay, now what? So, I mean, I mean, what do we as people who regard this life as an opportunity to wake up and, you know, cultivate awakened states, how do we handle it? And then also without without um you know without critique because everybody's on our own journey and we're all on our own we're on all where we're out we are in our journey and we all approach this from different levels of consciousness so to speak um how do you know what what do we do to help people when they're scared and unsure and you know and they're either looking at this as if they're religious as a punishment or are just feeling like victims of circumstances, which they then want to blame on whoever they can find to blame. And I mean, I mean, what do we do about that? Do we just opt out of that, you know, and, and work on our own consciousness and, or is there something that we can do that will be helpful, you know, in a material way? Uh, I mean, that's, a, you know, that's a question that concerns me. Um, even though I know I do, I do truly believe is perhaps the wrong word, but I do truly have the experience of the power that, that a clarified mind can have on the whole field. So, you know, I, I, I would say that at the very least, our dharma is to keep our minds as clarified as possible and that that itself is helpful. Yeah, you and I were talking about that a little bit yesterday, and um, we were talking about 
some of the conspiracy theories that have been flying around, um, and that it seems that so-called spiritual people are as much into them as anybody else is. Um, it, it, they don't; these theories don't discriminate. Um, right. And uh, we we discussed it with reference to the idea of clarity. And you mentioned a Sanskrit phrase from the Yoga Sutras, "Ritambara Pragya." Right. And why don't you define that phrase, and maybe perhaps we could discuss that in this context a little bit. Sure. So the, 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 the Sanskrit word pragna is another word for it, uh, pratibha, which means intuition. And intuition, a very high level of intuition, a very clarified level of intuition that basically comes online for most of us when we have cleared out <clears throat> the samskaric bank in meditation the storehouse uh, of impressions. The storehouse of impressions, right. The, you know, in the Yoga Sutra, they have a number of you know, wonderful Sanskrit words that are actually great to use because they're kind of like Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a language that's very specific about psychological, inner psychological and spiritual states. So a samskara in that tradition is the impressions that are left by your habitual th- thoughts and action. And then deeper than those are what are called vasanas, which are the word means fragrance. They're the, the underlying tendencies that form our character. And beneath that is the storehouse of, you know, of <clears throat> as if we accept reincarnation, that we've been, you know, the backpack that we've been accumulating for perhaps lifetimes and certainly for this lifetime. So pragna, which is the, the innate intuition, the wisdom, it's intuitive wisdom is a good good name for it. The wisdom that is belongs to all of us, that's present in consciousness itself, uh, and which can discriminate easily between you know, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, what's correct, what's incorrect, what's worth paying attention to, what's not worth paying attention to, and above all, what's going to take us towards you know, that state we call enlightenment, for want of a better word. So, uh, and the conspiracy theories that I see, even though many of them are based on a, a genuine intuition that and there's a lot of stuff wrong with this picture in terms of what's going on globally. Nonetheless, once the mind and the, you know, what we could call the egoic or lower self version of intuition starts to get hold of this, then all sorts of stories arise and they arise with a lot of force, you know, especially if you know, if we have an analysis that that is kind of true, I mean, um, for instance, Marx, you know, Karl Marx's analysis of cap- of the way capitalism works uh, seems to me to have been extremely accurate. His solutions, not so much. You know, so what was his analysis um, of how it works? Well, that 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 capital essentially does its best to uh, exploit the labor force. In, in order to make more profit for itself, and that this is bad for people, <laughs> you know that this creates all sorts of uh, of ills in human society. Uh, and of course, he's much more targeted and specific about that. But um, you know, I I think his you know the fact that there is unequal power distribution in this world is pretty correct, right? Um, the way you understand that, the way you deal with it, depends on many things, and there are many possible solutions to that, um, none of which seems to have uh, worked 100% in practice. Um, but, it, but still, there's a basic intuition. So let's say we have an intuition about the, about the source of the pandemic. And, and then we start, then our minds, you know, get into it, and we start looking for basically who to blame, which is what most conspiracy theories are about, right? And, and uh, and how we can get some measure of control in a situation that is fundamentally uncontrollable. It, for most people, control seems to come from coming up with a story that helps you explain it. And I think that that's a lot of what's going on now. Uh, and um, as I watch them getting farther and farther away from reality, I also can see that, that there are some, some truths embedded in many conspiracy theories. 
Yeah, it's usually called disinformation where there's a little bit yeah. of truth in there and it gives credibility or plausibility to the rest of it, which could be completely right. off the off the wall. Um, and there's nothing new about conspiracy theories. I mean, during the Black Death in the, I believe it was the 14th century or so, um, the king of France uh, asked the top minds at the university in Paris, you know, what was going on. And they came up with some astrological configuration that was responsible for it. And then others argued that, no, it was some ethers that were leaking out of the ground and, and causing all this horror. And then others said, no, it, it was blasphemers. So a lot of people had their tongues cut out because they were c considered the cause of the Black Death. So these are all conspiracy theories that had real consequences and, and, and had nothing to do with the actual cause of the Black Death. What were you right. going to say? Right, exactly. I said, I said, don't forget, don't forget the Jews who have been the, you know, who have been the, the targets of so many conspiracies. Exactly. That was part of it, also. Yeah, I, I think they, I mean, they actually got blamed for that one too. Yeah. <laughs> the Jews, you, you, your yeah, voice broke up a little bit, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know, re regarding the spiritual implications of this and Ritam Bara Pragyan, and so I, I think Ritam is probably mentioned by Patanjali because it is relevant in terms of discerning the very finest sort of structures of, of reality and, and discerning the, the real from the unreal and so on as a necessary means of attaining enlightenment. Would that be a fair summary of it? So the ritamba, the word rita means something like right. It has the same root, the same root as right, the same word, root as righteousness, and it refers to uh, to al uh, the uh, the alignment of reality with its deepest structures. So when you're in touch with the Rita, it means means you're part of the deep structures of the cosmos, and the decisions you make, the words you speak, the intuitions you have, uh, are correct in that they they show you the direction that the universe really wants to go in and uh, and that makes Ritambara Pragna unbelievably powerful and profound. It's it's the wisdom that sages come up with. Um, the thing that I, I've noticed about it in my experience of that kind of intuition, which is you know, which comes as a download, it's nonlinear. You know, it's like when you're when you're in the state of pragna, you're you're in a state that's very much like what is described as flow, you know, or or being in the zone. If you're an athlete, in other words, there's no thinking. You're just you just know, you know. You're you're acting on pure intuition, and it's correct. And the thing about being playing tennis is that you know it's correct because the ball gets to the right place, and your opponent can't hit it back. Right? I mean, there's there's a very concrete feedback system in uh, in athlete in athletics or music music. In you know, in intellectual uh, understanding, the feedback is much more subtle, and you know, often doesn't come immediately. So what can happen is that someone can get a download because we all have pragna, and and yet the mind can be so unclarified. You know, the intellect can be so full of stories that it interprets that you know, that wisdom, that download of wisdom, according to the stories. And then you can say anything. You can start a new weird religion. You, know? <laughs> you can, you can, um, you know, you can blame the Black Death on the astrology or, or on, you know, blasphemies or Jews uh, so, or on, you know, democratic governors. So, <laughs> you know, so uh, discerning your own pregnant from your bullshit is a, uh, it's a very subtle task. Yeah. So I like that phrase in there, alignment with the deep structures of the cosmos. And, you know, that to me would, if we had to define enlightenment, would be a pretty good definition right there, or at least a, a, a description of one outcome or result of it. Um, and so, you know, that sort of knowledge, that sort of capability should be of great importance to people who aspire to awakening or enlightenment and so on. Now, ironically, what often happens is people start to hear all these different theories. I mean, I have a 
friend who claims to be awakened and to have gone through the whole kundalini process and to its completion and so on and so forth. And, you know, she sent me something a while back that, well, there is no virus and it's just this sort of, um, five, it's the effect of 5G and it's all just this plot to um, get us all vaccinated because there's going to be some kind of magic dust in the vaccines, which is going to enable them to control us. Yeah. Um, you know. I've heard that one too. Yeah. So, uh, but the, the ironic thing is that, you know, spiritual truth is kind of subtle and it's hidden in a way. And so discovering it is a lifelong process of, you know, getting attuned or, you know, un unearthing something which is hidden. And, but all these conspiracy theories also allude to hidden stuff. You know, there's, right. a, there's the Illuminati and the secret government and Bill Gates, whatever Bill Gates is supposed to be up to and all this. So people kind of conflate, I think, the, the hiddenness of spiritual reality mm -hmm. with the hiddenness of the things that all these theories allude to. And they, they in, imbue them with greater legitimacy than, yeah. but it, and I don't know, you and I were talking about this yesterday. We were both starting to rant a little bit, but it's, a con it's concerning because, you know, we both care very deeply about spirituality and spiritual development and so on. And I, at least, and perhaps you see this as a pitfall or a, a you know, a, a trap that can waylay people, perhaps sometimes for years, and that also has real world implications in terms of how sick, how many people are going to get sick and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the real world implications worry me a lot. You know, I, I I do think that, you know, as we both know, your spiritual awakening can be hijacked in any number of ways by whatever belief system or whatever karmic baggage you have, you know, or whatever story you want to tell yourself, or where your ego gets tweaked by the powers that arise. And the Vedic yeah. literature is full of stories of people's people's spiritual evolution getting hijacked and then they have to they they fall to a great depth and then they have to retrace their steps over umpteen lifetimes and all that stuff yeah and and we've been those people i'm convinced you know yeah, I, probably so i would i mean i don't think either of us would be doing what we're doing if we hadn't you know been through this process over and over and over again forgive me all of you who don't who, who are watching and listening and don't accept the idea of reincarnation but just take it take it for a moment um so yeah, it, it's there's so many ways we can that our our awakening and our our intuition can be uh, colored by whatever is going on in the mind, and you know the big takeaway that that I've gotten during this during this process, and you know it's not new because it's been it's been present there in in my field for a long time, but because there's such a sense that we're running out of time. You know, we don't have a huge amount of time. And of course, uh, I'm reaching an age where I, you know, in the normal course of life, I don't have a lot of time. So the, the necessity for clarifying your intelligence and your discernment, it's, you know, actually kind of, we kind of desperately need to do that now. Yeah. You know, we can't afford to be deluded. And so I, I, the question is, you know, for me, the question was, how do I use this lockdown? You know, this the fact that all of my in-person workshops were canceled, so I have the entire summer to myself to, you know, uh, uh, and rather than filling it up with lots of online events, how, how can I use it to really cure the delusions that I'm, I still feel subject to? And I, I think that that's, that's absolutely the, the gift that this can potentially give to people like us. Hmm. What are some of those like, delusions that you feel you're subject to and what are you doing to cure them? Me personally? Yeah. Uh, um, well, the, the basic idea that, that the, you know, that the way other people think about me is determinative of how I should feel about myself, um, which is one of those lingering delusions that, um, very hard to get rid of. Um, the idea that you know that I have time, the idea that uh, that I can sort of lollygag around in my meditation and you know, allow myself to ruminate because there's always tomorrow, which is, you know which I think for many of us is it is especially those of us who you know I I, I sometimes say I'm a professional spiritual person you know my <laughs> entire life 
is about my spiritual practice. Uh, either I'm doing it or I'm teaching it or I'm writing about it or I'm talking about it. And, you know, whenever something deep and subtle becomes uh, professionalized or becomes part of your daily structure, then it gets, I, I can't think of a better word at the moment, it gets kind of tainted by your personal ambitions, by, you know, by what the culture is telling you is acceptable. And it becomes harder and harder to think for yourself. You know, and so for me, the delusion is that I'm I'm trying to to cure, to work with right now is to really understand what in the wisdom that I've received from my lineage and the other lineages which I honor, which in what in this wisdom is true and what in it is simply culturally determined, and how can I actually receive the guidance that I'm getting from what, for want of, want of a better word, I can call my soul and compare it to what the texts say and what my guru said. And, you know, how can I find the truth moment to moment without being constantly derailed by what I would like to be true or what, what is a fun thing to believe or what will make, you know, make me more acceptable to my peer group. Uh, and that's not, that's a, it's a moment to moment thing, especially if you want to be a truth seeker uh, in the sense of, you know, not coming up with a position that you adhere to for the rest of your life, but actually being open and willing and discerning enough to catch the truth in every moment. You know, that, that seems tremendously important. And in order to do that, uh, it, it requires, you know, noticing Am I in my comfort zone? Am I in resistance to quiet? You know, am I um, am I using you know my desire to keep up with the news as a way of distracting myself? Am I willing to to accept how much clutter am I willing to accept in my mind? You know, and and more and more I'm realizing uh, no amount of clutter is really acceptable in the mind if you are going to seriously make progress in a time like this you just have to be willing to clear it yeah that's good and it kind of relates to the the rhythm bar pragya thing we were talking about earlier of uh, aligning with the deeper structures of reality um because you know what you're saying is you don't want to be dwelling in sort of imaginal realms you you want your life on all levels to be in alignment with truth, capital T. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that doesn't mean you can't interact with the world. It doesn't mean the world is unreal. It doesn't mean you, I, I would say, it doesn't mean you, you shouldn't keep up with what's happening in the news. Um, you just have to keep a balance. Yeah, and you have to know yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I am capable of going down the rabbit hole of all the, you know, the news outlets that I get online. And I, you know, starting in 2016, with uh, the Trump election, I started looking at a lot of news websites. I have to know how much time I can spend with it, mm. you know, before it just completely fills my attention. And it's not that long, yeah. you know, it may be half an hour. I can do half an hour. So, so how do you, and that goes for a lot of conversations, you know, you want to be, you have people you want in your life and they're in their own rabbit hole. How much time can you spend with them and still maintain your own clarity and also maintain the friendship. So, you know, we're, I feel that we're, we really are in a make it or break it time, you know, and I'm talking about people like us, uh, you know, people whose, whose priorities are subtler, you know, it's a make it or break it time. We have a big opportunity and who cares where the pandemic is coming from? I mean, obviously we want to, we want to cure it. We want to cure our fragility of, you know, infrastructure and economy and medical and food supplies and all of that. But for you and I, uh, sorry to seem to be speaking to for you, but I think I, I think that's probably true for you and I. Uh, this is this is a big moment. This is a big opportunity to clarify our priorities and you know and decide on. Ascension, basically, on some kind of embodied ascension, 
in the time we have left in this world. Yeah, my orientation is sort of, I don't feel any sense of desperation. Like if if I were to die tomorrow, I, I wouldn't feel like, oh my God, I didn't achieve what I wanted to achieve in this life. I would, I think I would sort of defer to God's will and, and feel like, okay, well, this if this is the hand I'm dealt, that there must be a wisdom behind it. Um, I, w- I once saw a video of some yogi who was asked, like, you know, do you want to, is, is this your last incarnation? You hope never to reincarnate again. And he said, I don't care. It's not up to me. He said, whatever God wills, I'm happy to, to be in service, you know. And if right. I can be of service in some realm w- which is no longer human, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll be a human again. I, I, it's really not up to me. So I kind of feel that way. Yeah, I, I believe that's true. Absolutely. I just, um, I just like to make very clear that that I'm doing my part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, before God I helps say those it's who all help God's themselves. will. Exactly. Tie your camel. <laughs> right. So, uh, and you know, and that, yeah, and that's that's actually part of the discernment, I think. You know, uh, especially when we're being called to some sort of action in the world. I mean, whether it's whether it's teaching or counseling others, or you know, financial support, or other you know, other forms of community activism. We are, you know, we do have calls, pulls, obligations, and it's not, you know, it's not like we're we're going into a cave, but the discernment of of knowing what we're called to do the you know knowing what let's say what god wants us to do and as opposed to what what our ego or a, an opportunity that's arising is prompting us to do you know that that these are these are moment by moment sometimes seeming like trivial questions but they the answer you give can change the whole course of your life you know so uh, and what I think I was saying was that uh, one of the gifts of aging is that that it does give me a sense of okay, now's the time. You know, if there's anything I'm going to do, it, I have to do it. I have to do it now. And I think that's a great yogic position, actually. I, I wish I had felt it. I had felt it when I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> there is that saying of "make hay while the sun shines," though. And you were referring earlier to. Um... A sort of an in, an intensification uh, of the the field, as it were, the energy in the world. And I don't know about you, but I'm really feeling that. I'm, I'm dreaming a lot more. Yeah. And it's quite yeah. it's quite entertaining, actually. I'm just having these, you know, really quite creative, vivid, interesting dreams. But I think the whole some I heard some doctor on television saying that's because everybody was sleep deprived, and so now they're dreaming more because they're sleeping more. But I wasn't sleep deprived, and yet there's this this greater sort of enlightenment some, somehow have, happening, which I find quite enjoyable. But in any case, make hay while the sun shines. This, I think this is a time when people can evolve very quickly. And yeah. so take advantage of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and I, you know, we have different ways of motivating ourselves. Some of us motivate ourselves you know, as with carrots and some with sticks. I have to admit I'm sort of a... <laughs> I'm sort of a sticks person. <laughs> you know, I, I, what is it? Um, NLP says you're moving towards or moving away. So, um, I, I, I think that the the pandemic is pushing us. You know, it is a, it is actually pushing us to make these kinds of decisions. Uh, and and that's part of the meaning of it. I would say, from a human point of view. Yeah. I mean, on every level, globally, you know, culturally economically, societally, and certainly spiritually. One thing I said in the introduction uh, is that in our last interview six years ago, you and I spoke a lot about, um, you had just written a book actually about sort of the Maha Shaktis or something. And we, we spoke yeah. a lot about the subtle levels of creation and how those are every bit as real as the obvious levels of creation. Um, we just, it's kind of like you could think of the electromagnetic spectrum where <clears throat> I heard a, an analogy that if the entire electromagnetic spectrum were the length of the Mississippi River, 
uh, visible light that humans can see would be like several centimeters somewhere around Hannibal, Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's true of, but I think we're talking not just about the electromagnetic spectrum, which includes X-rays and gamma rays and all that, but something different, another dimension where there yeah. are there are subtler levels of creation, grosser and subtler, and. Most people, it's like a frozen pond where you just see the ice on the surface. But there are some people who are like divers with wetsuits that can sort of dive down through the ice and explore all the deeper levels of the pond. And some people live that way, you know, in, incorporating all the, the depth of, of creation within their awareness. And when they do, if they do, they find that those levels of life are just as full of forms of life as the gross level, they're just not flesh and blood bio biological life. They're so right. ma made of subtler stuff. So, um, right. you know, let's touch on that for a little bit. And do you have any speculation whatsoever as to, you know, what those realms, how those realms might relate to or be relevant to what we're going through on the obvious surface level of life these days? Well, there's a whole, as as I know you know, there's a whole conspiracy theory <laughs> based on the idea that there are subtle beings, sort of dark force beings who are who are mess messing with us. Uh, they have different names. That, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I certainly, I have to say, I, I do feel the ways in which different subtle energies affect our field. And, uh, and I, I don't think that's untrue. So, uh, and we often don't know what those energies are or even what the energies that we're aware of in groups of people or when we meet another person, we're often not aware of uh, the quality of the energy that we feel around them. So, uh, I think from one point of view, it is, it is possible to, to feel that there's a tension being directed at at you know the human field of consciousness from beings who who come from different subtle realms and that some of them are trying to help you know trying to awaken trying to guide and that some of them are uh trying to create mischief as i believe it was the mother of the mother of aravinda who wrote a lot about this kind of thing uh, you know she she was asked a question about are there dark forces in the universe, which Arbindo certainly believed there were, and she clearly believed there were. And she said, yes, but rather than thinking of them as evil, think of them as mischievous. In other words, many of these so-called dark forces mess with our energy because they can and because it amuses them, uh, not with necessarily malevolent intent, but certainly not with benign intent. So. You know that's one that's one perspective which comes from a woman who had really done a lot of inner work and had a lot of direct experience. Um, my own experience with subtle forces is that I I feel profound forces of grace in the universe, and you know I talk about them as goddesses. I, I remember the comments on on that interview we did. There was, were quite a few comments about this is Hindu pietism. Why do we have to listen to this? This is not non-dualism. Um, you know, in fact, it is non-dualism, of course, because a truly non-dual perspective recognizes that there, are, as you said, so many energies in the universe that that we can't be aware of from our perspective, and which are contained within consciousness. You know, yeah, without... non-dual doesn't mean there isn't any variety or diversity. Um, exactly. It just means that all the variety and diversity is, in its essential nature, oneness. Uh, right. But the oneness doesn't negate the multiplicity. Right. And and from a deeper, you know, or let's say a more personal perspective, one of the uh, the non-dual Shaiva views that I I very much. Uh, trust in, you know, and that I've experienced is that this whole universe is inside us, you know, so, so there is nothing here that is not including, you know, you and I are inside one consciousness. I'm in you, you're in me. The pandemic is in us. So, uh, you know, what that means, how we work with that, how we sort that uh, is 
kind of mind blowing. Um, the, one of the ways that that I have found to work with my sense of, you know, the wholeness as being part of my field is is really to do my very best to stay in, uh, as I was saying earlier, in a kind of auspicious minded connection with the invisible world, so that when I feel confused, when I when I feel stupid, when I'm, you know, exhausted, is to to just to just take refuge in these, you know, these energies, these, and, uh, and I've noticed that more and more as I do this, that, uh, as you said, you were talking about how much energy there is or how much available energy there is now it's affecting your dream world. It's affecting our meditation. A lot of my old friends who've been doing practice for a while have kind of secretly confessed to me that, Despite all of this, they've been feeling blissful during the oh, yeah. during lockdown, and I yeah, I, me too. So, so um, there's a huge amount of grace that's surrounding surrounding this field, uh, and I think it's very helpful to consider how we can tap into it, you know, in a in as hopefully as non dual a way as possible, you know, so that when we pray to Christ, we're not asking that Christ only come in to help his followers you know, and let everybody else die or whatever the fundamentalist view of that is. But just, just to begin to open ourselves to the recognition that, that, that how, you know, that your consciousness and my consciousness does contain the wholeness and that whatever method we find to, to spread benign energies through that inner field is going to affect the outer field as well. Yeah, you said something like that earlier uh, that we we continuously radiate, radiate an influence. And if we are awakening in our own consciousness, in fact, if we're feeling bliss, we're radiating bliss. And so yeah. we shouldn't feel guilty about it. We're actually helping to uplift everyone um, by helping to enliven the field in a positive way. Um, well said. Yeah. And... Um, there's a verse in the Gita that says something like, if, you know, if you support the gods, they'll support you. By gods, yeah. we would mean subtle impulses of intelligence that are orchestrating some aspect of creation. So I think that, you know, we align ourselves by the way we live our life and, um, with one thing or another. Um, Bob Dylan had a song that you've got to serve someone. It may be the devil, right. or it may be the Lord. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so if we're engaged in spiritual practice, I think we sort of, in some way that I don't fully understand, certainly, but we, we help to enrich and enliven positive forces in creation, subtler, subtler positive forces. There's a kind of reciprocal relationship, and they in yeah. turn help to support us, and life goes more smoothly and is better supported and enriched yeah. and so on. Yeah, and I, I do think this is one of the great, one of the great insights that the Vedic sages had. Um, We've covered some good areas, I think, in the course of this conversation. Um, I wish we had more time because I, I really, I never tire of talking to Sally. She's got so many interesting things to say. Um, but um, as, an, as an overview or as a synopsis, Sally, um, you know, obviously people who are listening to this are in all sorts of different circumstances. And for some, it's maybe, like you said, actually blissful and they don't have to worry about money and this and that and others might be having a really hard time of it and you know we shouldn't we shouldn't be cavalier about their situation we, you know, we need to be compassionate and they need all kinds of support which they may or may not be getting so you know maybe on a practical note you know in terms <clears throat> in terms of what you can offer you know what would you offer to this spectrum of people, let's say, going from the people who are having a good time anyway to those who are really struggling. Um, you know, maybe there'll be several different um, points which might be pertinent to different people along that scale. <clears throat> well, I, what I, as, you, as I've been listening to your question, I've been really tr I, trying to, to consider what is a universal form of uh, of of help that, or self help, really. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I think that there are a number of political solutions that, if we had the courage to put them in, 
you know, to put them to begin to bring them in, we could change a lot about the way people are treated. Uh, I I wish that the government was paying people salaries. I think it would just make this whole process as they are in other countries. But leaving that aside. Yeah, I was just um, listening to Sam Harris interview Andrew Yang, and he said, boy, were you prescient. I mean, you know, talking yeah, about really. universal basic income and all now, we're, you know, that would be so, so appropriate right now. Would be really appropriate. And, you know, and and I think it's worth putting a lot of energy into figuring that out and universal health care and all those things. Yeah, so, yeah. so that, but that's not, certainly not my field. Um, so when my students who, who are locked in with three kids and a spouse whom uh, they have a complex relationship with at the best of times, when they, you know, when they write in or call with, you know, with the suffering that they're going through and the feeling of uncertainty and just not knowing how to cope, I, there is this basic piece of advice, which is just pay attention to your breath, you know, in a way, no matter where we are, no matter what's happening, even if we are breathless, which I have a lot of experience with because I have, you know, pretty intense asthma, that nonetheless, the the, the breath flowing into the tips of the nostrils is going to settle your mind. Uh, You know, letting, opening to the feeling of your heart or any part of your inner body where you can take rest it's going to settle you. And, and I, I just, I believe we, we do need to, you know, to each one of us in whatever way we can find a way to take a little bit of time, you know, maybe every hour for one minute to tune into the breath. I know that's really hard if you're an emergency room nurse, (laughs) but, uh, but it, makes a huge difference and it's one of the it's one of the main ways we can take control even in you know in situations that feel uncontrollable is just just to remember our connection to the breath our connection to the heart Uh, and from that place ask ourselves these questions okay how can i serve this moment you know is this thought taking me towards greater happiness and clarity or is it is it taking me away from greater happiness or clarity? So that combination of of tuning into the energy of breath and really targeted inquiry questions that you can ask yourself, hopefully receiving answers that aren't based on the inner critic, you know, but but that are are you know we can train ourselves to actually hear from within what is what is a a, a helpful way of responding to a situation in the moment. I think that that the training that we give ourselves when we have one or two small interventions that we go to again and again is really helpful and will go on being helpful even after this is over. Yeah. I also, from my own life, um, place a lot of value on some of the basic stuff that we've been told all along is healthy for you, like getting enough exercise. Yeah. You know, and which could be tricky under these circumstances, but you know, do what you can. Um, getting enough sleep. I haven't used an alarm clock in 50 years. Um, eating a, a balanced diet. You know, I mean, a little comfort food here and there, a little ice cream or something, fine. But um, if we pig out on it because we're anxious, it's going to have very diminishing returns. Um, not uh, indulging in in various kinds of intoxicant, intoxicants to numb the fear, um, but actually just sort of working through it in a more natural way and getting rid of it once and for all, rather than sort of just um, squelching it. You know, things like that. Um, it's it's just sort of the, you know maybe a little bit of sh- short term challenge, but definitely a long term payoff. Totally, totally. And and I think I mean if you remember back in the day when you were trying to create a physical discipline or a food discipline or exercise discipline for yourself, it, there's a learning curve there, you know? So, uh, it, we don't, we're not, we're not necessarily successful in it all at once. And what I would, what I would say to people who are having a hard time with that is just like one day at a time, one step at a time. Don't worry if you screw it up, you can, you know, you can start again tomorrow. Um, and yeah, and build, build habits that, that actually help you. 
Yeah. And like, I, maybe you're not supposed to go to the gym right now because they might be closed, but that's a good example. Like you go to the gym and the first day you have sore muscles. It was sort of a lot of, uh, you know, kind of difficult and all. And even a week later, you might be thinking, this isn't really paying off. I still have sore muscles. But after a month, two months, three months, you really start to see it. So, and that can also be true of a spiritual practice like meditation. You might, you might not notice immediate effects, but um, you know, in retrospect, after a period of time, you think, wow, you know, something has really accumulated here. Totally. And and I would say one of the tricks of of um, creating a strong meditation practice is rather than looking at how, what is actually happening while you're meditating, because, uh, you know, is to look at how you feel afterwards. Yes, exactly. Because even if you're, you know, if your meditation is full of thoughts and, uh, you know, and ruminations and doesn't feel like you've meditated at all, the chances are that you're going to come out and you'll feel different because something will have been cleared by the mere act of sitting there and fielding your thoughts. So, you know, as a as a form of hygiene and self-care, it works even if you don't think it's working. Yeah. And a lot of times the clearing itself isn't a lot of fun, you know, because it's right. somewhat right. disruptive. It's like you're running a vacuum cleaner. It's noisy and, you know, commotion. But then, oh, the house is clean, you know, <laughs> once you've done it. So, uh, yeah. you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Good. Well, we better wrap it up. So um, thanks so much, Sally. I really appreciate spending My this pleasure. time with you and hope to see you again before too long in, yes. in the real world. Um, and thanks to those who've been uh, watching this interview and who I hope you've been enjoying this conference. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.